Structure 2 is all about models of bonding and structures, and we are going to start to talk through this over the next few videos with different types of chemical bonds that are called ionic, covalent, and metallic. The focus of this video is on the ionic bond, so let's go ahead and dive in. In the world of chemistry, atoms don't always stay neutral. They can gain or lose electrons, transforming into charged particles called ions. This fundamental process is crucial for understanding how chemical bonds form and how many chemical reactions occur. Let's first consider metal atoms. Metals, typically found on the left side and in the center of the periodic table, have a tendency to lose electrons. This is because their outermost electron shells are often only partially filled, and it's energetically more favorable for them to lose these few electrons to achieve a stable, full outer shell, like that of a noble gas. When a metal atom loses one or more electrons, it ends up with more protons in its nucleus than electrons orbiting it. This imbalance of charge results in a net positive charge, and those positively charged ions are called cations. Next, we can look at nonmetal atoms located on the right side of the periodic table. Nonmetals, in contrast to metals, tend to gain electrons. Their outermost electron shells are closer to being full, so gaining a few electrons allows them to achieve a stable, noble gas configuration. When a nonmetal atom gains one or more electrons, it ends up with more electrons than protons. This surplus of negative charge results in an overall net negative charge, and these negatively charged ions are called anions. We can often predict the charge of an ion formed by a main group element, those in groups 1 and 2 and 13 through 18, because elements within a group share the same number of valence electrons, meaning they need to give or receive the same amount of electrons to achieve their octet, making them energetically stable like a noble gas. For metals in group 1, the alkali metals, losing one electron results in a plus one charge. Group 2 metals, the alkaline earth metals, typically lose two electrons to form plus two ions. For nonmetals, group 17, the halogens, gain one electron, which gives them a negative one charge, while group 16 elements often gain two electrons to form minus two ions. This drive to achieve a stable, noble gas configuration is the key to predicting these charges. Things get a bit more complex when we look at transition metals which reside in the D block of the periodic table. Unlike main group elements that generally form ions with a predictable charge, many transition metals can form ions with different positive charges. This is because they can lose electrons from both their outermost S orbital and their inner D orbitals. For example, iron can commonly exist as iron 2 with a plus 2 charge, where it has lost 2 electrons, or as iron 3 with a plus 3 charge, where it has lost 3 electrons. The ability of transition metals to form ions with multiple charges is important in many chemical processes and biological systems. The specific charge a transition metal ion adapts can depend on the chemical environment it's in, such as the other atoms or molecules it's interacting with. Understanding this variability is crucial for comprehending the behavior of these elements in different compounds and reactions. The very essence of an ionic bond lies in the electrostatic attraction between cations and anions. Remember that opposite charges attract, just like the north and south poles of magnets. When a metal atom loses electrons to become a cation, and a non-metal atom gains those electrons to become an anion, the resulting positive and negative charges create a strong attractive force. This force pulls the ions together, forming a stable ionic compound. Think of it as a strong electrical glue holding the ions in a crystal lattice structure. An important skill in chemistry is being able to deduce the chemical formula of an ionic compound from its constituent ions. Since ionic compounds are electrically neutral overall, the total positive charge from the cations must equal the total negative charge from the anions. To determine the formula, we need to balance these charges. A common technique is the crisscross method. The numerical value of the charge of one ion becomes the subscript for the other ion. For example, if we have a sodium ion and a chlorine ion, the charges are plus one and minus one. Crisscrossing gives us Na1Cl1, which simplifies to NaCl the formula for sodium chloride. This charge balancing becomes particularly important when dealing with ions that have different magnitudes of charge. For example, aluminum ions and oxide ions. Crisscrossing the charges gives us Al2O3. This indicates that for every two aluminum ions with a total charge of plus six, we need three oxide ions with a total charge of minus six to achieve electrical neutrality. Therefore, the formula for aluminum oxide is Al2O3. Always remember to simplify the subscripts to the lowest whole number ratio if possible. Naming binary ionic compounds, which consist of only two elements, 
follows a straightforward rule. The name of the cation, usually the metal, comes first, followed by the name of the anion, usually the nonmetal. The anion's name is modified by dropping its usual ending and adding the suffix ide. As an example, the compound formed from sodium and chlorine is named sodium chloride. Similarly, magnesium and oxygen form magnesium oxide, and aluminum and nitrogen form aluminum nitride. Being able to interconvert between names of formulas and binary ionic compounds is very important, especially for the exam. For example, if you are given a formula like MgBr2, you need to be able to write the name of the compound. To do this, you first identify the cation, magnesium, and the anion, bromine. You then name the cation as is and change the ending of the anion to ide, resulting in magnesium bromide. Conversely, if you were given the name, such as potassium sulfide, you need to be able to create the formula. You do this by identifying the cation, potassium, and the anion, sulfide. You then balance their charges using the crisscross method to determine the formula, K2S. While binary ionic compounds contain only two elements, Polyatomic ions contain more than two. These are ions that consist of a group of atoms covalently bonded together and carry an overall electrical charge. With this charge, they can participate in ionic bonding with other ions. For the IB exam, and let's face it just for understanding chemistry in general, you need to know the names and charges of a few specific polyatomic ions. These include ammonium, NH4+, hydroxide, OH-, nitrate, NO3-, Hydrogen carbonate, HCO3-, carbonate, CO3-, sulfate, SO4-, and phosphate, PO4-. When writing formulas involving polyatomic ions, if you need more than one of that ion, you must enclose the entire polyatomic ion in parentheses and write the subscript outside of the parentheses. For example, the formula for calcium nitrate, formed from calcium ions and nitrate ions, is Ca NO3 close parenthesis, two. Again, make sure to memorize this list of polyatomic ions for the exam. Naming ionic compounds containing polyatomic ions follows a similar principle to binary ionic compounds. The name of the cation comes first, followed by the name of the anion. If the cation is a metal that can form ions with different charges, like transition metals, we often use Roman numerals in parentheses after the metal's name to indicate its charge. Example, iron two chloride or iron three chloride. However, for compounds with polyatomic ions, we simply use the name of the polyatomic ion. For example, NaNO3 is sodium nitrate, KOH is potassium hydroxide, and NH42SO4 is ammonium sulfate. Unlike molecules that exist as discrete units, ionic compounds typically exist as vast, repeated three-dimensional arrays of cations and anions called crystal lattices. Imagine a highly organized structure where each positive ion is surrounded by negative ions, and each negative ion is surrounded by positive ions, all held together by strong electrostatic forces. This lattice structure extends in all three dimensions, creating a rigid and ordered arrangement. Because these lattice structures are so extensive, we represent ionic compounds using empirical formulas rather than molecular formulas. As we already know, an empirical formula shows the simplest whole number ratio of the ions in the compound. For example, the empirical formula for sodium chloride is NaCl, indicating a one-to-one -one ratio of sodium ions to chloride ions within the crystal lattice. It doesn't imply the existence of individual NaCl molecules. The actual structure is a continuous network of these ions. Now let's consider the physical properties of ionic compounds, starting with volatility. Volatility refers to how easily a substance vaporizes. Ionic compounds generally have very low volatility. This is because the strong electrostatic forces holding the ions together in a lattice require a significant amount of energy to overcome. Therefore, ionic compounds typically have high melting and boiling points, meaning they remain in solid or liquid states over a wide range of temperatures. You won't see salt or ionic compounds easily turning into gas at room temperature. Next is electrical conductivity. In a solid state, ionic compounds are poor conductors of electricity. This is because the ions are held rigidly in the crystal lattice and are not free to move and carry an electrical charge. However, when an ionic compound is melted or dissolved in water, the ions become mobile and are able to conduct electricity. The movement of these charged particles allows for the flow of electrical current. For example, solid sodium chloride doesn't conduct electricity, but molten sodium chloride or a solution of sodium chloride in water does. 
The last physical property to discuss is solubility. The solubility of ionic compounds in water varies greatly. Many ionic compounds are soluble in polar solvents like water. Water molecules are polar, meaning they have a slightly positive end and a slightly negative end. These polar water molecules can surround the ions in the crystal lattice, with the positive ends attracted to the anions and the negative ends attracted to the cations. This process, called hydration, can overcome the lattice energy holding the ions together, allowing the ions to separate and dissolve in the water. However, some ionic compounds have very strong lattice energies and are not easily dissolved in water. This brings us to the concept of lattice enthalpy. Lattice enthalpy is the measure of the strength of the ionic bond in the crystalline solid. It's defined as the energy required to completely separate one mole of a solid ionic compound into its gaseous state. A higher lattice enthalpy indicates stronger electrostatic attractions between the ions and a more stable crystal lattice. Two primary factors influence lattice enthalpy, ion charge and ion radius. According to Coulomb's law, the force of attraction between charged particles is directly proportional to the product of their charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. In ionic compounds, this means that ions with higher charges will have stronger electrostatic attractions and thus higher lattice enthalpies. For example, magnesium oxide, MgO, with doubly charged ions, Mg2+, and O2-, has a much higher lattice enthalpy than sodium chloride, NaCl, with singly charged ions, Na+, and Cl-. Similarly, ion radius plays a role. Smaller ions can get closer to each other, leading to stronger electrostatic attractions and a higher lattice enthalpy. Conversely, large ions have their charges more spread out, resulting in weaker attractions and lower lattice enthalpies. For instance, lithium fluoride has a higher lattice enthalpy than potassium iodide. Because lithium and fluoride ions are smaller than potassium and iodide ions, allowing for a closer interaction and stronger attraction. 